so yeah good everyone so the topic this week is um sort of short term versus long term um care and burnout so i came up with some prompts here but it might be a bit more free form than this and i'll switch to that question and answer mode that we tried last week just to kind of go through each of these um but i thought it might be interesting you know this is so you know emma and jonathan are doing things next week you know and i think there's a difference between what's acceptable now um and what your students will accept now uh, but we're already talking about what happens in september and going forward from there and what's acceptable in september um and what about 2021 where will we be then you know, even if we're back on campus what will things be looking like and what uh, how will we be structuring courses um so i think it's interesting in terms of our short-term priorities you know uh, both institutionally and individually you know what do you need to get it done now and then medium-term approaches what would be useful in terms of your institution is that having a you know a learning design team all those kind of things um how to promote care for our students in our courses and i think that's kind of paramount at the moment um and I, I thought we might explore in that um you know as individuals we can promote care but um do you come up against institutional barriers with that you know the things like you know is it okay to grant extensions for assignments or something you know and, and i think it comes back to a lot of this emotional support stuff we know how to measure the other stuff we don't we know how to measure emotional support but that's what's needed at the moment and i thought last we might think about who is liable to burn out um in your institution you know um, i don't know how many of you read uh, brian lamb's uh, blog post last week you know about his team you know uh, they're at thompson rivers university uh, in canada you know and how hard they've been working you know not sort of doing an online pivot for the entire university sort of overnight you know and there's teams you know people who haven't been sleeping and all that kind of stuff so I think it might be interesting about kind of, I mean, we're all potentially liable to burn out, but were there particular people or uh, roles that might face that? Um, does that sound like a good set of things? I meant to say, yeah, just so just to stress again, if you want to talk, everyone's got microphone access. Uh, just scroll your mouse over where you can see me talking up in the top right, it should be, and a little microphone icon should pop up. If you click on that, you go green, you should be able to talk. Um, and also, uh, happy to talk about anything else you want, of course. Um, let me just, so I'm gonna switch to the, the Q&A session just because it looks nice. Uh, so in this, if you type your message in the chat and click on the little blue question thing, and it gets published as a question up here, and then I can click publish. So what's, what is acceptable now for students um, and for yourself and for your institution. I think you know there are perhaps different uh, aspects to that. Um, I, I think I shared it a couple of weeks ago. Um, Phil Hill talked about four stages of the pandemic response. You know, and I think there's the, the kind of immediate shift online, which is like you know, put your classes onto Zoom, and then sort of that moves into more institutional responses um, and then kind of more long-term thinking so i wondered um emma if i can point my finger at you <laughs> how are you so what's kind of been acceptable for you as you're, as you're delivering next week you've probably been making these decisions all the way along oh okay don't you sorry Emma. let me see oh no you didn't sorry it wasn't intentional sorry emma you should have uh microphone access now Is my video on? <laughs> uh, I don't think you've got video access, but I can certainly okay, good, good. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I've kind of got um, a dual role, if you like, at the moment with um, sort of leading for the School of Management on um, digital delivery, but also my own unit. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be teaching myself online um, from next week like i said um but we've sort of set three um requirements if you like um so in the school of management at bristol um so i've said that we should be doing weekly voice recorded lecture content so whether that's narrated powerpoint slides or 
um, if people decide to lecture synchronously um, just as a short term fix, if you like, and mm -hmm. then at least one guided activity for students to work on, um, whether that's again a synchronous like tutorial or um, like non graded tests. Um, with instructor feedback or um, you know like blackboard journal submissions or facilitated discussion forums or things like that and then also um, making sure that staff hold office hours at internationally convenient times so we are given two hours a week um, to uh, dedicate to office hours and just making sure that staff do keep up with those I think um, it's easy to think the best of everyone and I think the risk is that some staff are seeing this as an opportunity to maybe get out of teaching and to just get on with their research which is um, worrying for me um, but yeah so I'm kind of these are the, sh the short-term fixes that we've identified and then it's just thinking about um, the scenario planning for going forward so um, what does blended learning look like? And also, if students aren't back in September, then what is a better version of what we can do than just this short term fix? Excellent. Thanks, Emma. That all sounds very uh, sensible. I think, yeah, uh, so Claire's been putting a few things in the comments. I guess it depends where students are in the study as well. So if they're in the middle of a study, in the middle of a module, like any very university student style, um, then it's enough material for students to successfully complete their modules without detriment. If you want to jump in, Claire, go for it. Um, I think, you know, from an open university perspective, we really have the kind of emergency provision. We do sometimes have courses coming out um, and they're, for various reasons, not as well prepared as we would have liked. So um, I think clear guidance is always the, the thing that we try to give students, you know, so this is what's coming. Um, and, you know, and make sure they know what's coming uh, and this is what's going to happen. So they don't feel lost, you know, it's like, so I think um, that really helps. Um, so even if it's just to say, we only know what we're doing for the next three weeks, but don't worry after that, you know, here's, here's a rough structure at least, because uh, you might not be able to do a lot of the the signposting that you would usually do in a kind of more, um, more sort of well-designed course, I guess. Um, and I think it's so clear, um, your point, ensuring no one is disadvantaged, I think that's, um, a good point, and uh, and uh, Emma touched upon that. I think you know, having different time zones, for instance, is, is really important. As people may have gone home to different places, so you can't just assume everyone's now on just because they're not on, on campus, they're not sort of um, in our, necessarily in our time zone. And you see lots of making assumptions about students can have technology and decent kit and good places to set up. Um, and we sort of covered a lot of that in the student support session. Um, but I think, um, so Ken says, uh, asking what students re need is really important to not assume about what tools they have available. Yeah, so I think um, being flexible around all of that is gonna be uh, important. And I think, but I think there's also a question about what students want as well. And if they're assuming they're, certainly in the UK, still paying for their education, and they kind of want and some, you know, seen, seen reports of some students wanting refunds and those kind of things. Um, so they still kind of want some some form of um, uh, of a course. Uh, and then and I said last week, we've we've canceled some of our assessments and our courses and some students don't like that, you know, and uh, Stephen who was in last week did a really good piece around kind of what's the ethical decision to do in that, that, that situation. If anyone wants to jump in, please do. Going to, I think. Um, yeah, you are too. Yes, I can. Hi. It's interesting. The OFS said this week that they uh, that they're not supporting the calls for refunds where courses have gone online, only where they've been delivered badly. So that will be an interesting one to see how that is. Um, Mm. How is that is pursued in the courts? Be very interesting. There was a really good legal seminar uh, webinar a few weeks ago um, that talked about force majeure uh, claims that students would be able to make. So uh, I think universities are gearing themselves up for this. It will be interesting one to watch over the next few months. Yeah. Uh, 
Jonathan, did you want to speak? I see your Sorry, I, yeah, it just popped. Um, I'm thinking perhaps about what is acceptable for September. Maybe I was just wondering whether or not, not so much what's acceptable, but are, 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 any, are the things we're doing now things we wanted to do anyway? And actually, we're using it as an opportunity to get them through, and it's more what's desirable rather than what's acceptable. Yeah, I think uh, maybe acceptable is the wrong word here. I think there's, you know, desirable might be a better term. Thank you. Um, the point you raised about you know, the things you wanted to get through anyway, I think is really touches upon a really interesting sort of debate that's been going around. It's like, is you know, putting aside that we know kind of all the kind of, you know, what a disaster COVID is, you know, and, and how tragic it is for so many people, and kind of in, in pure ed tech terms, is, is there kind of like, oh, now you get to, people get to understand what it is and you get to push through all those things you want to do for ages, the kind of opportunity being there. But the negative side of that might be everyone does it in such a hurry now that you end up with mm. really bad um, online teaching and everyone says, Christ, I'm not going to do that again, you know, it's like, <laughs> then it's done. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so perhaps um, this question is more about what's necessary, <laughs> what's necessary in September uh, in order to keep students happy, make sure we're delivering what we need to do and also not to kind of like, completely destroy any idea that online learning is effective you know so um, I had conversations last week with somebody who said they've been approached by uh, different uh, different countries to try and help set up open universities and they've been asked questions you know like you know higher uh, distance education isn't as high quality as campus education think, really we've had these discussions kind of a long time ago and you think you know that you uh, you kind of met all those things but actually when they said asked me to give evidence of that it's probably not some, you know, there was all bits and bobs I was pulling together. So I think it's interesting that we can try and demonstrate that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm say I'm worldwide, London worldwide, so that's a distance learning organisation yeah. as well. Um, I, I, I just think that uh, so many of the things that are done online have such disproportionate scrutiny compared to what's face to face, and it's an opportunity to say things like, um, you know, there's so many things that's wrong with say the lecture as a format but yeah. we don't question it is it now the opportunity to, to try something different that might work or be just as effective online and I, I don't know because i'm not an academic so i don't know i i I'm, i lead a team of learning techs so um, yeah yeah so my last question might be focused at you then jonathan about which t who faces burnout it might well be your your sort of team well possibly but this is what we do we, we don't do we build online courses so I don't think burnout's right. It, we, you know, may, maybe we're, we're, time will tell. But uh, yeah, yeah, we're just seeing. We're, we're just we're just following the "don't waste a good crisis" kind of. Um, <laughs> yeah, there is a bit of that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. So uh, John says induction for new students is going to be difficult and not easy, even at the OU, where students expect to be at a distance from the start. Um, so that is, um, yeah, that's a big point. We covered that in this slide because I think there are, there's lots of kind of onboarding stuff. Um, but it's going to be really, I think you're right, you know, my daughter's supposed to go to university in September. It's like, and, you know, although they do some stuff on the, the VLE at school, it's, it's a completely different thing to try and be a, um, a distance learner. Uh, so, Emma, you've asked, how much input does the learning design team have at a module level? Um, I don't know if that was aimed at Jonathan or, or me. Uh, at the Open University, we have, we have a specific learning design uh approach and team um i'll try I'll, when someone else is talking i'll dig out the uh, url tickets to get in the chat uh, so we have a, a learning design approach uh, so we have module teams um and they consist of academics uh, editors um learning designers and uh tech um, learning technology specialists so you know, there's a kind of whole range of people that come together in those teams uh, and the learning design people, uh, and we have a methodology we follow, which, which encourages the the module teams to sort of think about different approaches that they use. Um, and we have, you know, a number of tools that we use for that. But sometimes, and often they're kind of quite simple things. They're like we have a uh, a pack of cards we use, which um, come under different categories of like uh, pedagogy, technology, those kind of things. Um, and we give them out to the team, and we ask them to sort them into the so I think it's like forty in a pack, and so sort them into the 12 most important for you in your course. Um, and then they all do this in a group or in pairs, whatever. Um, and then we ask them to sort of rank them 
and that and the point of that is that it really brings to the surface uh, different conceptions that people have about the, the the module. So I did one, for instance, and one of the words was innovative, you know, like, and, and someone else went, "I don't want this course to be innovative. I see it as kind of very traditional." And they kind of been, they've been operating on these like they thought they were kind of aligned up until that point, and suddenly there's this kind of big understanding they were thinking of the course completely differently. So there are a number of these uh, tools we use. Um, we've got some online designers, but there's quite a lot of learning design stuff out there. Uh, but I think partly those things are just useful to there's no kind of like one sort of regular sort of algorithm to design a course it's more about i think useful ways for helping people to think about um what they're designing and just to prompt them to think is this the best way to teach it and i think go back to jonathan's point he just made you know, like you kind of don't just, we don't question the the lecture in a way because that's just how you do stuff but when you go online there's all different options open up you know? um, so, so just to go back, so um, come September, I think the kind of Zoomification is probably not likely to be acceptable. Um, people are going to want a more structured course, and I would get, I would suggest a clear kind of study calendar. I think Claire mentioned it earlier: the mix between synchronous and asynchronous. Um, a mix of activity types um, and uh, you know appropriate assessment particularly if you've shifted away from exams kind of a, as a as a minimum um, and so in order to realize that I think uh, there might be some interesting things like if you're not just going to be recording your lectures um, then how are you going to have acceptable resources and this is where you know, the idea of open educational resources you know using other content that you know is of a reasonable quality and then we discussed this in a previous session i think but, you know constructing your activities around it so here's the content whether that's reading an article or whether it's you know studying a, a, a piece of oer but then what you do is construct the activity around it and that's more doable for september than creating the entire content yourself, I think. Uh, does anybody want to jump in with what they think September will look like? Hi, Jonathan. Hi, sorry, yeah, I, uh, sorry to keep talking. Um, no, please do. I, 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 I just think it's, that's okay. Um, your point there about, sorry, I, I've lost my thread here. But I'm thinking that some of the things you're describing there is the stuff that we would do for our online courses, you know, um, that that approach. So there's less, there's less lecturing kind of thing. There's, there's more discovery. There's more um, student centre stuff. So, and I, I saw uh, something from EduCourse come this morning, but I haven't followed it up about a universal design for. I mean, based on universal design for learning. Um, so, uh, my my point is really, my question is, do you think that Sorry, uh, I lost my train of thought when I was trying to open up a document. I had some stuff I prepared. Um, but um, do you, have have we begun polling students to, to to ask them whether they would like to go back to what it was, or do they think that this way of teaching um, is more beneficial, more, um, or do they really want to go back? I mean, I, I have a, I have a problem, as you probably gathered very early on, with cramming 300 people into a lecture for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I think it's, I, you know, I come from an online, a distance learning organisation, so it's perhaps to be expected. But do you think students would want to go back to that, or do you think some of the solutions we're putting in quite quickly now, rudimentarily now, but hopefully to reinforce uh better as we go on do you think these will be what students want in the future or do you think this is simply a stopgap i think um this I mean, predicting the future is always difficult but i was in a, a session last night a, a webinar session and tony bates from canada was talking yeah. and he was sort of trying to predict what will happen um and i thought his, his analogy his uh, predictions were probably spot on he said yeah we'll see a a rise in online only uh, but he said it will probably level out over the next sort of two three years and it'll only account for something like 15 percent of, of universities doing that or 15 percent of offerings um, but what would be 
continue to rise and what would be the sort of dominant and interesting would be some kind of hybrid blended model so and that would be the thing that's the kind of real impact i think so um i think in answer to your question it's difficult uh, tom crick on twitter has been trying to run a, a student survey sort of nationwide about what students perceptions of the kind of online pivot um and i think that's so it'd be interesting what comes out it's, it's difficult sometimes because if students haven't had experience or they haven't had good experience of online then you tend to revert mm. to what you know and your kind of model your you know the sort of narrative you have in your head is of the kind of the lecture and the lecture theater and that kind of stuff um but i think we'll see a kind of much more blended approach you know so uh yeah so for Emma says, I don't see what content can't at least be given digitally and face-to-face -face use for guided activities. Yeah, so you know, what people have started to call the kind of the flipped model in higher education is, might be one of those things that, um, yeah, increasing blend, increasing flip, I agree, so John says. So, you know, here's the content. What, why do I stand up and just deliver the content to you, you know, when you've got study hours and study time, but we'll use the face-to-face -face time to do other things. Um, that are more productive and i think once you've made that push um you know so the thing that has disappeared or will disappear is the you know, the, the claim that we can't possibly do it for my course because hey we've just done it for your course you know <laughs> so like having made every once you've broken through that it's uh, i think it's difficult to go back often isn't it and we're seeing it with lots of other things like suddenly the things that we were told we couldn't do online it turns out we can do online so it's, you know, i think it's going to be, i think homework is going to be an interesting one isn't it so, People have been told, no, you can't work from home. Uh, suddenly they have to work from home. It's like, well, <laughs> when we all go back now, it'd be interesting how many people say, well, can I carry on working at home? Um, if anybody wants to speak, jump in. Um, and I guess just, just to extend that, you know, perhaps that, perhaps I've already answered this question, but I just talking all the time. And what about 2021? You know, obviously we can't predict what, uh, what happened with the pandemic by then assuming we're back to some levels of social norm um, I mean I, th I think the other thing that's going to happen of course is that lots of universities are going to be financially hit at colleges and uh, institutions uh, particularly with the loss of overseas students so um, that will have a big impact on what education looked like um, and I, I don't believe online education is cheaper um, but it might well be um, a model that some want to adopt um, so I think by the time we get to 2021, we'll probably be looking at this um, blend much more. So I'm afraid, Emma, you'll still be <laughs> delivering your online call for, <laughs> courses in 2021, or maybe some mix of them. So John has asked Claire, who says something about um, mergers between FE and HE. Okay, do you want to come in on that, Claire? So Claire said she expects to see um, mergers between FE and HE. Uh, yeah, I, I just read something from Hefco made made some said something in one of their pronouncements that there, there was going to be more collaboration between HE and FE in in Wales. That's just in Wales. Yeah. Because FE are adept at uh, well, against some universities are more adept at delivering online than um, uh, un traditional universities. So it'd be interesting to follow what uh, Hefco was saying in in that regard. And also, it was hinted at by um, a few vice chancellors in, in their statements as well that I've been following. I think it might be interesting. So, the type of courses we see might vary as well. You know, I think by the time we get to 2021, you know, there have been a big economic impact. So, whether that will mean more vocational courses, more conversion courses, more kind of like lifelong learning stuff. So, I think we may see a, a kind of further sort of flexing of what it means to do higher education or what universities provide when they're, when they're doing that. Definitely more emphasis on accelerated degrees, work-based learning and apprenticeships. That, that, that In Wales anyway, certainly, that's the yeah. direction of travel, I would say. Thanks, Claire. So, um, at the risk of just getting the same answers to everything, um, I wondered what our, what the short term priorities would be for 
people. Um, so jump in. Uh, and I think we cover some of those and what we need to be acceptable. But I guess it's also priorities in terms of um, staff development and those kind of things and uh, what kind of infrastructures needed to be in place. Um, and I think for that, so Jonathan says online assessment, yeah, and, and acceptance of online assessments. So it's not just being able to do it, it's um, having in place the administrative procedures that will allow allow it to be passed by your quality boards or whatever it looks like. So um, when we introduced uh, online learning at the Open University and um, I wanted to have a, a final assessment with no exam. You know, we had to fight fight that a lot, you know. But we but the thing we put in place was this idea of double marking and the tutor saying, as far as I'm concerned, this is the students' work, as far as we can tell. Um, and and but it was it, you know the battle was more about the admin than the technology, although there was a bit of a technology battle as well. But. Uh, And I think that might be true for lots of things. So as Jenny says, moving assessment online is one thing, getting colleagues to understand the assessment needs to be different, i.e. not just exam paper available for two hours is the challenge. I'll say exactly, Jenny. Yes, that's very well put. I think, um, yeah, so we for me, so you've seen lots of universities go, okay, we'll do exam proctoring um, now, and that's what we'll do, because then we can just run the exam. But that's not the we covered assessment last week, but I think um, that's a really good example. And so, so what that wraps up is several things. One is the technology. The second is the kind of staff development needed to kind of help people understand, educators understand different ways of assessing. And the third is the kind of policy part of that triangle, if you like, to allow different types of assessment to be recognised and what that means in terms of plagiarism and quality checks and those kind of things so so even like a kind of fairly what you might think of as a fairly simple thing um brings into play all, all those aspects that all need to kind of be merging together uh, john says can students cope with online assessment um i guess what, it, what you mean I guess it depends what you mean by online assessment john do you mean uh, quizzes or just you know essays that you submit online or I, I was thinking i mean um if you if we have a we have a global audience of students um varying technological challenges as you'd expect in certain countries uh, pakistan mm -hmm. bangladesh as well but also i mean you you we mentioned technical i i think uh, moving online the technical challenge is probably the easiest one for us to solve yeah. Uh, the hardest one, I think, is we, you know, we're, we're not as large as Open University, but we still have tens of thousands of students. We have to hold their hands to online assessment. Perhaps yeah. it's actually not the students that can't cope. I'm wondering whether we could cope on that side with the with the, the sort of pastoral side of things. You know, I, I think the lift and shift of exams online is, is yeah, is less challenging. Than... Yeah, and maybe that goes back to um, a point I was making about the lecture as well. It's partly just what you're accustomed to and you sort of said Jonathan that we don't we don't see anything wrong with the lecture because that's kind of what we're used to seeing you know it's like mm -hmm. you know there are lots of problems with it and it's the same with the exams like so there's kind of less of a kind of cognitive load if you like in understanding what an online exam is than there is understanding what a different type of assessment is but I think um the, the problem, if students have a problem with online assessment that's not just an exam or a quiz, is um, when it's not clear enough, you know. So we're very clear with the Open University. We, um, certainly at postgrad level, one of the things that I often do is I give students the, the marking guide. This is what we're looking for, you know. So, so they know exactly what they're going to be doing. And there can be a bit sort of, you know, box ticking, you know, you're going to get up to five marks for having your references formatted in the right way and those kind of things but but if you're not if you're not there to kind of tell them all those things they can disproportionately put effort into one part which you know they could only ever get five marks for or stuff so um uh, i'm sure ken's cringing at my <laughs> breakdown here <laughs> from the ungrading perspective but, you know, but i think helping students know what it is that's required of them in quite a lot of detail um is really helpful and that's what they need because they, they will always um, find ambiguity in what you think is um, um, you think is kind of a clear essay or just a title and often 
in a face-to-face -face situation, you'll do a lot of kind of explanation around that and answering questions that other people will be listening to and they'll be chatting to each other. And I think people underestimate how much that kind of clarification goes on. Um, yeah, that's right, Ken. Yeah, what we think is clear isn't clear at all from a student perspective. Um, and so I think really helping students know what they what's required of them in the assessment and required early on as well before they get there. Well so we do a lot of signposting them. This will be coming up in your assignment. Be thinking about this now for when you need to do your assignment or make some notes now that come up with that. Um, and we, you know, I've just been writing a course today actually, um, which is, um, and we've introduced students to a learning log there, you know, and the point is, it's a post-grad course, but you know, the point is to try and get them in the habit of, you know, everything they're doing, recording it and building it up um, towards their, uh, their final assessment. But you flag up early on what the final assessment is, and then the learning log is a, a path towards that. Uh, so John says, uh, ambiguity also looms disproportionately large in uh, computer marked assignments. Um, do you want to say anything about that, John? You don't have to. <laughs> if you, it sounds like you've got a particular experience there, or perhaps a oh, it, experience. It's just that um, any um, ambiguity of the question, uh, students really get terribly uh, worked up and upset, uh, even when it turns out to be a you know a fractional percentage of their mark. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's it's really hard to prepare questions which are not ambiguous and where students are, feel that they're being tested so it's stringent but they're actually um, not being disadvantaged by some sneaky wording is the way they often uh, express yeah. it. Yeah so I think yeah, that's a really good point uh, John because I think actually you know because you haven't got the the kind of human sort of agility in a, an online assessment it's like so you so either you kind of so you have this little sneaky wording which of the following is not an example of things that, oh, well, okay, so you can sort of trick them into getting the wrong answer. Uh, or you think you've worded it correctly, but actually there are two answers that could apply if you've looked at it a certain way and, and you're right, you know, even though the actual mark might be, you know, 0.2% of their overall mark, it still kind of feels, it undermines their trust that they're being sort of fairly assessed. And, and as you say, uh, we might be moving to more of those that kind of assessment as we shift online um, and actually writing good uh, computer marked assignments is a real real skill i think um, was one thing you could you can do uh, like they did on ds106 is get students to come up with their own assignments so on ds106 um which is jim groom's digital storytelling course they got students one of their tasks was to get students to create tasks or activities that other students could do um, and they give them points like one two or three points i think it was and then each week you have you're told um you should do three points worth of tasks for this so you can either do like three easy one pointers or one more difficult three points and you just choose from an assignment bank that was quite a, a neat approach i think Um, and um, we probably covered this, but um, medium term approaches, I, I guess I'm thinking here perhaps more institutionally what might be required as we shift this. I think um, perhaps some of the other people in here who are in other university can speak to this. You know, it's like at the Open University, I mentioned we've kind of got this big multidisciplinary team approach, uh, and, and it's going to be difficult for other universities to replicate that and at the same time. Have their face-to-face -face mode going and having having both systems running in parallel becomes expensive but certainly i think more structured ed tech um, or instructional design or whatever you want to call them units is going, are going to be required um i broke a blog post a while ago before this or moaning about how uh, ed tech units are often quite sort of rootless, you know, they, they get shunted around. Sometimes they're in with the library, sometimes they're in with the IT support, sometimes they're in sort of staff development, sometimes their own unit. And the new vice chancellor comes in and says, now our priority is MOOCs. And so, and so they never, they don't 
have much trust in themselves and they kind of get shunted around a lot. So I think senior management is going to need to start taking, I would say this, <laughs> senior management is going to need to start taking kind of their ed tech units much more seriously, I think, and um, perhaps with respect. I don't know if anyone has any experience of that from a, another uni they want to speak to. So it can often be very um, disparate as well. So you have these little pockets of expertise spread out. Um, and that's an interesting model, whether you kind of embed it within the different faculties or whether you have a centralized unit. And I think at the Open, open University, we've tended to do a bit of both and go through both models. Uh, John, yeah, good point from John. So there's library resources also. Um, if you want to say anything to that, John. But, um, whether I take it you mean whether we libraries and other universities shift to be more of an online library, you know. Um, although yes, I know. So, yes, definitely. We're thinking about access to journals and so on, um, but also textbooks um, um, to the extent to which people structure their course around a textbook or not. Um, yeah, but it's also a, a a study place, isn't it, for many universities or many. Mm many students see going to the library as being part of what it means to be a student. So it's also a sort of larger enculturation into you know, what it means to be a student, what it means to be an independent learner. Um, might need a bit of a shift, I think. In That's a very interesting point. I think you're right. And it goes back to that sort of the whole concept we have of what being a learner is. But I think a lot of that is your sort of sense of identity as a as a university or higher education student is tied up in those images, you know, of like going to the library and sitting in the lecture hall, doing lab work, or whatever it is. You know, like if the library is not there or um, you're not encouraged to sit in it, then um, how do you replicate some of that feeling? I mean, I think you know, at the Open University, our library is nearly all online, but it's still a physical building. You know, we do still have physical books and physical journals and things that you can go in and access. Um, but also I think there'll be a pushback then on some of this like so for instance digital textbooks uh, publishers still do this thing as kind of enforced scarcity where only so many people can loan it from the library at one time it's like that, may, that makes no sense you know it's, like, it's a digital thing as many people can have it as they want but like in order to try and replicate their costs and replicate the costs of scarcity they've introduced this kind of false notion um, and i think there, there should be quite a good pushback and all of that but I, i'm pretty sure the publishers will find a way to to profit from a lot of it um so i think the idea of the library being a destination students go to is important now, some students need these physical spaces they just can't work effectively at home on their own that's right i think you know um i think by 2021 hopefully there will be some campus spaces again that people can use but yes it's less of a it's less as much the resources as a and it's the same with kind of public libraries in in cities as well as in towns and that you know i go to cardiff library a lot and it's just full of people fight having a safe place to be i think in many places in many cases so um, we'll need that and, then, and i'm not sure you can ever recreate that dig uh, digitally because it, it is a physical thing but certainly you can make a digital version of a library an online version at least a, a place where you can go and be and get support and, and those kind of things. Perhaps, perhaps it will make us, it will make some people um, realise the importance of the library again. Uh, so going on to one of the questions we wanted to promote was how to promote care for students, but also we could expand that to staff, I think. Um, we covered some of this in the student support uh, session I think um, but I wondered if people had any thoughts about you know coming up against institutional barriers where your desire to be caring um, might sort of come into conflict with things that universities and institutions see as part of their uh, so Claire says GDPR issues do you want to expand on that 
plan? In speaking in my capacity as an AL with the Open University and uh, the, just from my experience with the SSTs, they can't make outward bound calls, for example, at the moment because of GDPR issues. And obviously, yeah. you've got to be very careful when you're dealing with issues with, with some students' mental health uh, because students present themselves with such a plethora of different issues. You've got to have people who can handle those at a distance. And I don't think in... in um, where I work in my day job, we perhaps have got those skills suitably honed as well as perhaps they have in the Open University. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, yeah, so what's, and I think it suddenly puts you into lots of issues and we, we discuss this the other way around and sort of the, the icebreaker activities that might be okay in a classroom might not well work online. They might put people at risk of revealing things about themselves and the home setup and that kind of thing. Um, and I think um, you know so we're seeing things like you know, not being allowed to grant extensions for um, assignments. And, you know, there'll be discussing like exam proctoring, which aren't exactly caring solutions, and still insisting on anti-plagiarism things. And that I was wondering if you wanted to say anything, Ken, if you're still there. Um, so I know you still make care quite a central part of what of what you do. Is there kind of any specific tips that you gave or would give? I need to unmute my physical mic. Yeah, I can. Um, hi. So um, not to go into ungrading more, um, I have this thing I've been doing for like four years where I ask my students to meet with me three times a semester. And I think it's become more important um, right now because a lot of our students are lonely. They, they, they need they need some contact and I think um, we shouldn't enforce that contact on them, but I think we really need to check that they're okay. Um, and so my um, system where I have a you can book me page where they can reserve time a 15 minute session with me and just chat about content or chat about how they're feeling. And um, that's been really helpful for me to get a, a pulse on how my students are as well as um, giving something for them. And I offer that for the faculty and anyone else actually. And then the other thing is, um, trying consciously just to check in on them at the beginning of each class session and spend some time checking on everyone's well-being. I think that's really important during my class sessions. Thanks, Ken. Um, and I wonder whether, I don't know how sort of strict your system is, but whether in some places you sort of almost have to account for all of your time and whether, you know, five hours a week chatting to students to give them emotional support would be kind of accepted in, in lots of institutions you know it's like it's um um you know we really have to kind of account for every hour often particularly if, and particularly if i think the, the issues off it was uh, is with um a lot of precarious staff you know it's like you can't afford to do that because it isn't part of your your contract i guess and that exposes whole other issues around you know um uh, how we pay and, and structure labor in um he so i'm just got distracted there so i think the last question we were going to say um what i was going to say was uh who is liable to burn out and what should we do to avoid it i think this is um i'll just say something from the university perspective but i think it's probably less for us so the OU probably wasn't as well prepared as absolutely might have been for all this and we still had um student support teams that were based in kind of call centers um, and still have a central campus and lots of staff didn't have laptops but compared to most universities the impact has been less than you know other places um, but i think it is that um i think you know staff who aren't used to working at home are finding it quite a struggle you know who like going into the office and value that office um campus commitment you know that are finding that they're finding it quite difficult uh, staff who are dealing with issues and from students and uh, particularly um, yeah. students who are submitting uh, exceptional circumstances claims and those kind of things so Emma says so much attention has been given to students safety nets for them but I don't think thought has been given to the implications of these for staff also struggling in the current situation yeah I agree and I think, you know, 
people have been asked to do a load of other stuff on top of things, but not necessarily being told to drop anything as well. You know, I think in some ways, some things are just dropping anyway, things like the ref and the TEF are disappearing. Um, but for, I think for, to go back to an issue we talked about earlier, and identity is a big issue. I think for lots of academics, um, uh, support staff and all sorts of things, um, you know, part of their identity of who they feel they are is wrapped up in that campus experience, if you like. And if you take that away, it's quite a, a knock on them, either their sense of professionalization or you know their social perspective of who they are. Um, and that's, that can have quite difficult you know implications i think that we, we struggle to identify see a few people are typing and i think you know just we've been asked so you know people have contingency leave where we are at the open university and they've been very generous it's, you know, it's very good so i can't complain but i think it's, it's almost like there's a 10 to 20 percent cognitive emotional load um <laughs> just deals with you know, operating in the apocalypse, you know, it all comes with its own load. So Ken says, I received an email from a human resources department asking if I was okay. Directed to all of our international faculties. That was nice, yeah. So just kind of checking in. John says, could be a more learning professional life as well for students, even for those who routinely work at home sometimes. Yeah, that's right, I think. Yeah, I, mean, you know, I work at home quite a lot, but it's, um, it's a different thing when <laughs> that's all you've got, you know. So like i like watching netflix but that's all i've got to do it can be a bit of a struggle i don't know if anyone wants to camera on this if they sort of think of people in their institutions they've seen sort of struggling particularly it's kind of hit hard Okay, um, does anyone have any other questions they want to raise? Yeah, coming up to the hour. Well, I just sort of stuck some in there to prompt things, but I know people have got different issues or are there any comments they want to make in particular, as this is their last one. Uh, another thing you might want to comment on or suggest to me uh, is if this is the last drop-in session, um, are there other things that we could do from the Open University that might be useful for the sector um, open to suggestions on that not that i have any power but you know Seen a few people are typing, so I'll let them type. I saw John asked me a question. I missed it. Okay, I'm cool. Expecting an answer. Um, actually, I just answered them, and that's why I didn't see your message. <laughs> I just answered and said thank you for the support and, and told them about the coffee sessions that I'm doing to try to support other faculty. So Claire says, course design, how to do it, masterclass in that. I think, yeah, I think that's the type of thing that they will start to offer more formally. Uh, Emma says, some case studies to give other institutions an idea about just how much resource is needed. This isn't something that module leader can just take on by themselves, i.e. design and delivery. Absolutely, yeah, I think that would. I think actually, you know, we've got lots of this stuff. I was um, saying something there. So I'm going to ask my colleagues um, in IET at least, but probably across the university. Um, thanks, Ken. Thanks for coming in. Um, whether we could have a Google Doc where we can dump in things we know that work with some evidence, you know, which I think might be a kind of useful starter pack. Okay, Claire, enjoy OU module design. 
So I'll get that going and see if I can get any input on that document. Okay, so I think that's it. Well, thanks for coming, everyone, who's been joining us over the past few weeks. And um, good luck out there. Stay well.